morning. It is wonderful to be with you in worship today on the seventh Sunday of Easter on May 29th, 2022. As a congregation, we are still continuing to provide as safe as possible an environment for our youngest and immunocompromised folks. So while in worship due to singing, we ask that everyone continue to wear a mask outside of the sanctuary when there's not singing, masks are optional. And thank you all so much for continuing to keep everyone's safety at heart. Also, if there are parents in the room today, I just wanna let you know that in the sermon today, I am going to talk about the acts of violence that happened this past Tuesday. And so in light of that, children of all ages are welcome to go to story sermons with Miss Allison today. And I just wanted to give people a heads up that that is coming. Friends, let us prepare our hearts for worship.
Friends, if you're able, please stand for our call to worship. Praise God, who has raised Jesus Christ to new life. Praise God, who sends the Spirit to empower the church's life. Praise God with trumpet sound. Praise God with flute and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with strings and pipes. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. may be seated. As we just sang in our opening hymn, the world is still in pain, and we all felt that so clearly and so closely this past week. Earth feels very far from heaven, and although I have sometimes felt that the line about the grim demonic chorus feels out of place in that hymn, maybe not today. As a person, and as a church, and as a country, we need to cast out sin and say to all the ways that our voices add to or allow a cultural chorus of death, dealing, and violence, get you gone. First, in a time of silence, let us confess and listen to God convict us, and then let us confess with our voices together, but first, let us be in silence. And let us pray together. Living God, we confess to you our lack of faith. Although we have called you the God of hope, we often feel lost, cynical, and without hope. The world is filled with suffering, tragedy, confusion, and darkness. And we can feel like hope is far away from us. We are hesitant to step forth from the shadows of our own fear in order to claim your promises of resurrection hope. We confess that we are part of the problem. Our insensitivities and prejudices stand in the way of new life in our world. We know that the world is full of suffering. Our brothers and sisters are nailed to crosses of poverty and oppression 
People close enough to touch are sealed in tombs of loneliness and despair. And yet, we fail to reach out, fail to step forward, fail to raise our voices to help. Forgive us our sin, wash us clean, and give us new hearts so that we may speak and act with compassion, honesty, and justice. Through Christ we pray. Amen. In the desert all surrounding sea, a spreading tree has grown, healing leaves of grace abounding. Forgiveness is like this, a miracle like a tree in an all surrounding desert. And when we are forgiven, then we can hope for a renewed world based on Jesus, our strong companion, and God who is first and is last and is always with us. And it is only because Christ is risen that this next part is possible. Friends, hear and believe the good news that comes from God. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. confessed and been forgiven and have renewed hope, we now have a good news to share with each other, which is the peace of Jesus Christ. The peace of Christ be with you. reflections and this morning we are continuing to have a great treat we will be hearing from Marianne O'Brien read by Kathy Gogler so Kathy I invite you to the lectern Marianne has been a member of Lewinsville for almost well for over 60 years now and she lives in Maryland and is really unable to join us, but she graciously submitted her very long memories of this. And I, I will say very well-written memories. In June of 1954, my husband and I, with our three-year-old daughter, rented one of the old farmhouses on Kirby Road while we looked to buy. On the first Sunday of residence, I drove up Great Falls Street, past farms on either side, to worship at the White, the White Clapboard Church. Several days later, Frank Gapp and our then minister, Dr. Newman, came to visit. I committed to membership, the start of a long and wonderful journey within Lewinsville. The Little White Church had no room for educational and social activities, so a second structure, Denham Hall, named after a former pastor, had been built. It boasted a large gathering room with a stage and a warren of small classrooms in the understory. During the 50s and 60s, young families flooded into McLean. New homes dotted former farmland. Lewinsville's trustees planned building the Red Brick Church to serve the growing congregation, which, during the pastorate of John Graham, who had been born in England, grew to be the largest in Lewinsville's history. Worshippers filled both Sunday services. There were 60 future baby boomers in my daughter's confirmation class. With the new kitchen, Fellowship Hall provided space for social activities, so there were frequent potluck suppers on Sunday evenings. Church school also took place in Fellowship Hall with classrooms formed by movable partitions. When the Christian faith and life curriculum was instituted, I began teaching. 
The curriculum was a three-year study, Christian church history, the Bible, and the life of Christ. How firm a foundation that became for me, and it has continued with adult education classes, many of which have been helpful in relating Christian belief to current events. I am grateful for the magnificent music Jay Clark brought to Lewinsville, and for the creative talents of John Notaft, who has shown us that there are many genres of music that can fit into worship services. At Lewinsville, I have always felt anchored in a realm of goodness among a congregation reaching out beyond itself to minister to others whose plans and programs look to Jesus' advice on how to live lovingly, harmoniously, and compassionately with humans worldwide. Lastly, I think of members and pastors for whom over long years I have felt admiration and deep affection. Thank you, Mary. I know you're listening to this. <laughs> At this time, if there are any children, I would welcome them to come forward, or children who are out there watching by a live stream, if this would be time to scoot a little closer to the screen, and we're going to all be children of faith today together. So Pam is about to read a story to us from the book of Acts, which is about Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas are people who lived a long, long time ago. They were some of the first Christians, and because they were some of the first Christians, they went on a lot of travel telling people about Jesus and starting new churches, and they were in this one town, and this hard word, Macedonia, and they were telling people about Jesus, and for some convoluted reason, it got them into a little bit of trouble, and the crowds had Paul and Silas put into jail. It was unfair. They weren't supposed to go there, but, and eventually they do get released, but while they were in prison and they were in chains, I think Paul and Silas did this really cool thing that I think we can all do. They must have been scared and anxious, and they didn't know what was about to happen, but Paul and Silas decided to sing. And they were singing about God's love and singing about God. And I think that that's something that we can all maybe do when we're scared or anxious or don't know what's about to happen. And so I'm going to sing a really simple song this morning, and you are welcome to, to join if you know the song. I'm going to put my mask on for the singing part. So you are free to join me in the song if you know it. Um, and kids at home, please join in if you know it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells us so. Let us pray. Gracious God, in the moments that we're scared or anxious and don't know our way out, please join us in that moment, reminding us of your love. In your name I pray. Amen. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. God of mercy, you promised never to break your covenant with us. Amid all the changing words of our generation, may we hear your eternal word that does not change. Then may we respond to your gracious promises with faithful and obedient lives through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning's lesson is uh, scripture is found in Acts 16 uh, verses 16 to 40 and if you'd like to follow along you may do so in the New Testament at page 136. Listen for the word of the Lord. One day as we were going to the place of prayer we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune-telling. 
While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God, who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself since he was supposed to, since he supposed that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted in a loud voice, do not harm yourself for we are all here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At the same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up into the house and set food before them. And he and his entire household rejoiced and he had become a believer in God. When morning came, the magistrate sent the police saying, let those men go. And the jailer reported the message to Paul saying, the magistrate sent word to let you go. Therefore, come out now and go in peace. But Paul replied, they have beaten us in public, uncondemned men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And now are they going to discharge us in secret? Certainly not. Let them come and take us out themselves. The police reported these words to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them. And they took them out and asked them to leave the city. After leaving the prison, they went to Lydia's home. And when they had seen and encouraged the brothers and sisters there, they departed. The word of the Lord. Please join me in prayer. Holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. So as many of you know, my previous call before coming to Lewinsville, I was the pastor of a congregation on the inside of a women's cor corrections facility. So I know a little bit about prisons. But what you might not know is that before I was ever allowed into the prison or given access to my congregation, I had to graduate from the core academy of corrections workers, which means I am officially a, can work in a corrections environment. It meant that I attended a six weeks class where I had to learn all about corrections. I had to learn about self-defense. I have 30 hours of self-defense training. I learned about use of force. I had to have hostage training, like what if I ever got taken hostage? 
I had to learn about de-escalation, and one of the classes was all about cuff training, handcuffs and ankle cuffs. You know, these are all the things that you think a pastor might need to know. <laughs> but in one of the classes I was attending, we were being trained how to transport an incarcerated individual, and somehow I was selected to be the guinea pig or Perry the platypus for the class, meaning I got to be the individual all chained up. So the first thing they do is put on the ankle cuffs. There's chains between them, which then that's attached to a chain around your waist, which then is attached to chains behind your back, to your handcuffs. And then I had COs in training on either side and behind me walking me down the hallway to a van that was outside. Because of this, um, you have to take very small steps. Running is impossible in this situation. If I had fallen, I couldn't have caught myself because of the way my hands were chained. That's why people were on either side and behind me. And because of this, I had the literal feeling of being chained. To be chained is to be confined, controlled, and left completely vulnerable to the mercy of those who have captured you. Now, once allowed into the prison, I was actually very grateful for this tangible experience because it gave me an understanding of my congregants. At some point in their incarceration, all of them had been transported, which meant that they had been chained in this sort of way. And I had felt that incredible sense of vulnerability that they felt. And so it was interesting to me that one of the most requested worship songs by my congregation was a song entitled Chain Breaker. You'll get to hear this song today after the sermon, but the chorus goes like this. If you got pain, he's a pain taker. If you feel lost, he's a way maker. If you need freedom or saving, he's a prison shaking savior. If you've got chains, he's a chain breaker. So I have to say, after worshiping with folks who were literally being chained on a regular basis, this song and stories like our text today from the books of Acts takes on a different sort of literal meaning. What does it mean that our God is the breaker of chains? Our scripture text this morning is from the book of Acts, which is the only narrative book in the book of the New Testament that does not tell the story of Jesus, but rather tells the story of the first Christians and how our church came to be. The Apostle Paul is most likely the most main character of the book of Acts. So from about chapter 9 until the end of the book, Acts tells the story of the Apostle Paul. Now Paul was a Jewish man who at first was radically opposed to the Jesus movement within Judaism. But then, after an intense encounter with the resurrected Jesus on the road to Damascus, he converted to Christianity. And then he began going on mission trips throughout the Roman Empire, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ. And so our story takes place today during Paul's second mission trip. Typically, when Paul would arrive in a new city, he would set up in a local market as a tent maker. The tent making helped provide income for his travels, but it also was strategic because it gave him access to large groups of people to whom he would then preach and share the story of Jesus. And so that is the background of our passage today. Paul and his travel companion have arrived in Macedonia, and while in the market, they encounter a slave girl who is making money for her masters by providing um, divination and oracles. This sort of divination was actually a common form of spiritual expression within the Roman Empire. But in our text today, we are told that she is following Paul and Silas and declaring them to be servants of the Most High God who know the way to freedom. It's interesting to note that she's speaking truth. Like other stories of exorcism in the Bible, somehow the spirits and demons can testify to the truth of Christ. But something about this interaction with the girl angers, or as our text today says, annoys the Apostle Paul. We're not told why he's angered by it. But I wonder if he's angered by this girl's enslavement. She's not only enslaved by her owners, but she's spiritually enslaved to a spirit. She is speaking truth, but not able to access that truth for herself. 
And so I wonder if Paul is angered by the injustice of her situation. And so he commands the spirit to leave, and it does. She is immediately freed from the spirit. However, no one who witnesses this exorcism rejoices in this girl's newfound freedom. Rather, the owner becomes enraged at the loss of money that her newfound freedom will cost him. This is, not, this is also not unusual in the New Testament. In fact, there are several occasions throughout the New Testament where a healing threatens the local economy and the crowds will react intensely. It happens when Jesus casts demons into pigs, his life is threatened and he has to leave town. It happens to Paul in Ephesus when the silver artisans get angry because too many people are converting to Christianity and not buying their idols. And it also happens when Jesus flips the tables at the temple. He was threatening the local economy. And in all of these situations, the crowds get angry and reactive to the economic loss. And it often leads to either the incarceration of the healer or a demand to execute the one doing the healing. And so that happens in our story today. A riot breaks out. Paul and Silas are arrested and taken before the magistrate who has them beaten and incarcerated. It says they're taken to the innermost part of the prison and bound in chains, and so in modern lingo, they are placed in maximum security prison. They are captured, beaten, chained, and vulnerable to their captors. In the spring semester of 2005, I had the opportunity to spend my own semester studying abroad in England, and while there, I had the privilege of a lifetime. There, Nelson Mandela, who had mostly retired from public life at that time, was making a rare speech in Trafalgar Square at a Make Poverty History rally. So on February 3rd, 2005, I got to see and hear Nelson Mandela in real life. This is a time that has become more and more precious to me as I get older. Nelson Mandela is one of the world's great heroes. He has been described as a universal symbol of hope and courage. His given name meant shaker of trees or a troublemaker. The name Nelson was given to him by his first grade teacher as his Christian name because it was a common practice in South Africa that black children have names that white folks could pronounce. And so Mandela was a member of the Tembu tribe and was born as royalty as the son of the tribal king but in his 20s left his tribal home and moved to Johannesburg to attend the only higher education school in South Africa that would admit black students. But while a student, he quickly faced many injustices and quickly joined the African National Congress, or the ANC, and he fought for the rights and equality of all people in South Africa. But as you may know, in 1948, South Africa put into law apartheid which was a legal and systemic form of racism. Trevor Noah, in his book, Born a Crime, describes apartheid as the most advanced system of racial oppression known to man. Apartheid was a police state and a system of surveillance and laws to keep black people under control. Apartheid was a system of laws to figuratively keep people in chains. And so in the 1940s, Mandela became a lawyer but his commitment to the ANC took precedence in his life, and he became a prominent figure in the fight to end apartheid, at times risking his life. In 1960, government security forces attacked a peaceful demonstration, killing 69 protesters. And after this massacre, everything changed for Mandela. He made the most controversial decision in his life he changed his stance on nonviolence, stating it no longer made sense to respond to a violent and savage government with nonviolence. And because of this new stance, he was eventually arrested and charged with treason. He was almost sentenced to the death penalty, but instead received life in prison. At his trial, he stated, during my lifetime, I have dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I have cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. It is an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve, but if needs be, is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. 
At 46 years old, he was sentenced to life in prison at Robben Island, an Alcatraz-like prison with brutal conditions where he was often isolated in a cell without a bed or running water. And as a political prison, prisoner, he was victim to brutal abuse from the prison employees. He was forced to do hard labor in a lime quarry, which did permanent damage to his eyesight. Truly a hopeless and desperate place to find oneself. But our Acts story tells us that at midnight, when it seemed completely dark, Paul and Silas were singing songs to God and continuing to preach and share the gospel of Jesus with their fellow prisoners. When suddenly, the earth heaves and the prison shakes, the doors fly open and everyone's chains fall off. The jailer wakes and when he sees that the doors are open is horrified, knowing what happens to jailers who permit prisoners to escape. He draws his sword and prepares to take his life, but Paul says, don't do it. We're all here. The jailer's both relieved and confused. He says, you were bound, but now you're free to escape. But Paul points out the truth of the situation, saying, no, we prisoners are free, and you, our jailer, were chained, but now you are also free to escape. The jailer says, what do I do to be saved? What do I need to do to be free? And he was baptized. Paul offers freedom to the jailer in the same way he freed the enslaved girl at the beginning of our story. While Nelson Mandela was incarcerated, he gained notoriety throughout the world and was actually able to eventually smuggle his autobiography out of the prison so the world could hear his story. Eventually, a global movement began to release him from prison. An earthquake of a different kind was taking place. So in February 1990, the South African Prime Minister announced to the world that he was releasing Mandela unconditionally. And when he was released, he had been incarcerated for 27 years. That is a lifetime to spend behind bars. But after his release, he didn't just go to the beach to rest. He said, I'm going to continue for my work with the ANC. And so he devoted his life to bring his divided country together, to bring democracy to all people, the right for all to vote. In 1993, he received the Nobel Peace Prize. And on April 26, 1994, South Africa's first ever free election took place. This was the first time in Nelson Mandela's life he was allowed to vote, and it was also the day he became South Africa's first black president. Will Willimon, a New Testament scholar and preacher, in his commentary on the book of Acts about our text today, asked the question, what does it mean to be free? He states, if there's one virtue on which we can all join hands and agree on, it is freedom. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom is the blessed treasure of academia. Freedom to think, teach, pu publish. Freedom is also a blessed treasure of this pulpit. Freedom to speak as one feels led by God to speak. We Americans have built a society which has given us unprecedented measure of freedom to its citizens. I am given maximum space to aggressively pursue what I want as long as I do not bump into you while you are getting yours. What we call culture is a vast supermarket of desire where citizens are treated as little more than self-interested consumers. He goes on to say the nine to job, five job, monthly mortgage payments over programmed children, dog eat dog contests for grades at university. He says, this is our freedom. And he asks, are we as free as we think? Willimon points out that in our act story, everyone who at first appeared to be free the girl's owner, the judges, the jailer, is actually a slave. And everyone who at first appeared to be enslaved, the enslaved girl, Paul and Silas, and the prisoners, are set free. So what does it mean that our God is a God who liberates us from our chains? What does it mean to be set free? As I'm sure you all know, this past Tuesday, the unthinkable happened again. A gunman entered Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, killing 21 people of 19 were children, young children who were preparing for their summer break, who had just been celebrated for their honor rolls. They had their lives unnecessarily cut short
by senseless violence. This is the worst kind of news. It's the kind of news that unsettles a nation, but is sadly not an isolated event. The shooting occurred just days after a mass shooting in Buffalo, New York at a grocery store, and after a fellow PCUSA church was targeted by a gunman in California. It is clear that there is a problem in our country with violence. And I think our, the question our text proposes to us today is timely. What does it mean to be free? Are we free or are we confined, controlled, and left completely vulnerable to the whims of the next person who chooses violence? Going to the grocery store, attending worship, sending our children to school, I believe we should be able to do these activities with some certainty that we are safe but it does not appear that we are living in that freedom right now. This weekend, we are also celebrating Memorial Day. It's a day that is a federal holiday in our country to mourn US military personnel who have died while serving in the United States Armed Forces. We remember and honored those who believed that freedom and democracy was an ideal worth giving their life for. And I would argue that the situation we find ourselves in always in danger of the next mass shooting is not the freedom for which they gave their lives. I'm sure I'm not alone in feeling as though I was in the dark this week. Is there a faithful response to this tragedy? I will admit that I felt buried in hopelessness, wondering if a solution to this problem is even possible. As a staff, we've been reading Brene Brown's book, Atlas of the Heart, and in her book, she says, when we are faced with information that challenges what we believe, our first instinct is to make the discomfort, irritation, and vulnerability go away by resolving any dissonance. We might do this by rejecting the new information, decreasing its importance, or avoiding it altogether. The greater the magnitude of dissonance, the greater is the pressure to reduce the dissonance. But in these challenging moments, she says we actually need to stay curious and resist choosing comfort over courage. For in this turbulent world, the most important skill is the ability to rethink and unlearn. For the truth is that the solution to mass acts of violence in our society is not quick or simple. For it is in fact the result of many different social injustices colliding with one another. Therefore, to heal, there will be vast amounts of changes needed. We will need an act of God that shakes the very foundations of our society, that breaks open the chains we are bound up in. Healing will take precedence over economic gains. And I also believe that the Holy Spirit is among us and calling us to action. For like Paul, let us use our anger at injustice as motivation to bring Christ's freedom into the world. And action could look different for all of us. If you feel called to pray, then pray as often as possible. Invite your friends and your neighbors and your colleagues to join you. If you think more people need to know Jesus and have faith in God, then be about that work sharing Christ with all you encounter. If you believe that access to guns needs to be limited, then protest and lobby our government to change the law. If you feel that this is a mental health crisis, then lobby our government or support nonprofits that are trying to bring systems to care to all those who suffer from mental illness. If you have an idea that I haven't mentioned, act on it, tell me about it. I wanna join you in it. Nelson Mandela stated when he became president, the truth is that we are not free. We have merely achieved the freedom to be free, the right not to be oppressed. We have not taken the final step of our journey, but the final step on a longer and even more difficult road. For to be free is not merely to cast off one's chains, but to live in a way that respects and enhances the freedom of all people. Let us pray. Creator, redeemer, sustainer, help us learn as a community to walk in your ways of peace and humility, rather than our own ways of violence and pride. We turn to you in prayer and we ask that you point us to the grace of your gospel 
the good news of Jesus Christ, where radical forgiveness is found in a man arrested, incarcerated, and crucified. Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus, who died for each of us. Lord, let your amazing grace transform our community. Let your kingdom come where swords are beaten into plowshares, guns are melted into garden tools, and tanks are transformed into tractors. Be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path that we may follow the example of your disciples as we share to strive everything you provide in common with our community. Bless our hands, touch our heart, move our feet, walk alongside us this day and every day. In thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Amen. I invite you now to stand as you are able as we recite together the words of the Apostles' Creed as our affirmation of faith, and you can find them in our worship bulletin. And let us say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. 
As we prepare now for our time of offering, I invite you to sign the greeting pads that are on the center aisles and pass them down that you might see with whom you are worshiping. Today, we join Elaine Guth in giving thanks to the glory of God for the wedding of her daughter, Kristen Guth, and Samuel Schneider that happened on May 14th. And as this is a weekend full of a lot of gratitude as we think about Memorial Day and the gratitude we have for those who served our country, and we think about the gratitude that we always find in the hope of Jesus Christ, from that spirit of gratitude, let us now have our morning offering. Let us worship God with our offerings.
be seated. As we come to our prayer time today, I wanted to share with you that we heard from Chris Ziemba, who has played jazz piano for us multiple times of the death of his mother recently and unexpectedly, and we send prayers to Chris and his family. Most of my prayers today will be taken from um, our denomination or from the Presbyterian Church in Uvalde, Texas, and I will reference those throughout the prayer. And let us join our hearts now in a time of prayer. Lord, in our prayer today, we join Pastor Ginny Norris Lane of First Presbyterian Church Uvalde when she prays. God of comfort and assurance, we acknowledge our fear and our hurt and our worry. We pray for protection and yet feel vulnerable. We live with hope and yet search for forgiveness. Even as we stand in the valley of the shadow of death, we are your people gathered yet broken, forgiven and forgiving, searching, striving, hoping, praying, wondering. Sit with us in the midst of our hurts and our heartbreak. Guide us in these moments as we pray and in the days ahead that we might do your will here on earth as it is in heaven. And we add our voices this morning to the prayers of the people of First Presbyterian Church, lifted up on slips of paper last week. Blessings on all the medical professionals who served during this tragedy. Prayers for children and the burden they will carry. For caregivers to keep going. For teachers who want nothing more than to keep their kids safe and to send them home to their families. For wisdom for parents on how to walk this road with children, including what to say and how to say it. The strength to love our enemies. For God's spirit to break in and provide all that everyone needs. And we join with Presbyterians around the country praying today. Our hope and strength needs renewal to continue the fight for justice, the fight for safe places for our children, for your people, Lord, and we are tired of excuses. Send the power of your Holy Spirit. Turn our sadness into compassion, our tiredness into advocacy. Use us, work through us, and if necessary, work in spite of us to mend the brokenness and bring your realm of peace to earth. And now as we close our prayer time, and as we grieve over this Memorial Day weekend, may we find the strength to love with sacrifice, inspired by those who serve and served. May we be more mindful of our responsibilities to you, O God, and to all of your children, as we honor the example of those who put others over self, a higher calling over small comforts, who exemplify lives of purpose and courage. May we be grateful for the gift of life as we remember those who gave theirs for our country. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, God with us in all things, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, as we prepare to follow Christ into the world, I have several announcements for you this morning. First, I would point you to the back of the bulletin where you have a full list of all that we have going on with the congregation. Um, the Kanar Scholarship, it is time again for people to apply. This is for anyone who is college eligible in our congregation. You can apply. The deadline is by July 1st, and it is for a $2,000 scholarship. If you would like um, access to that application, please let me know, and I will send it to you. It's all done online. Uh, but deadline for that application is July 1st. Next week, due to the 5K and fun run, there will be no adult CE next Sunday, but please mark your calendars for June 12th. There will be a really fun and exciting class that will be happening. It'll be led by Rob Hunter, Rachel Russell, and Crawford Brubaker, who I know. Um, <laughs> the class will be called the Insider's Holiday. It'll be a look at Pentecost, but it'll be on June 12th, so mark your calendars for that. And next week, friends, it is here, June 5th. It's Pentecost Sunday. We will be confirming our confirmands and worship, but before that, next Sunday morning, we will be doing our big 5K and fun run. 
there's still time to sign up. Please help volunteer. There's lots of ways to be involved with this exciting project that the church is doing. Um, and there will be a lock-in the night before for all youth. All youth are welcomed to attend our lock-in. We'll be having a great time together, and then we'll be helping with the run the following morning. So get excited for next week. It's the big time. And then finally, the refugee resettlement team would like to say a huge gr um, gratitude to the congregation. We have almost had every single item on our needed list donated by this point. So we are really grateful for all the people that have stepped up and helped out. We're hoping that this week we'll be connected with our family, so stay tuned if there's any last minute needs. We might have to send a blast out to the congregation if anything comes up. But thank you all so much for your support of this ministry that we're all doing together. And then finally, I would like everyone to know that this coming weekend there will be two memorial services. So this coming Friday on June 3rd at two o'clock in the afternoon, there'll be a memorial service for Steve Stevenson. And then on Saturday, June 4th at 2 o'clock in the afternoon for Bob Alden. Friends, thank you so much. as you leave this place, go in peace. Remember to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and all your strength. Remember to love your neighbor and never ever forget to love yourself. And may the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and all days. Amen. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Be to God.